Uh, good morning, Crossing Church. Um, my name is Gene Klingbill. I'm an elder candidate here. And just so happy uh, to be here with you guys and, and bring God's message um, and, uh, yeah, and, and be able to worship with everybody. Speaking of worship, I, I got to take a second. And so Barry was kind of embarrassing me and, um, and everybody up here. So I'm going to embarrass him for a second. Uh, they, they do an amazing job every Sunday. And I think they bring it every Sunday. And I don't know if you know this, but they're here super early um, every week, uh, preparing and fine-tuning their craft, um, just, just the whole group of, of worship people here that we have and um, the people in the back, and I just want to thank them for all, all they do. Uh, it's just truly an effort to get everything going here at the church week in and week out. Um, literally right now, we've got a bunch of people in the back loving on your little ones, and we're just so grateful for them. And normally we have the K-5 through going on right now. But today, they're in here with us. So um, they're going to be doing bingo today. So if you're new here or have never experienced this, this is going to be special. Um, they may yell out bingo. Don't be alarmed. That's kind of normal right now in this service. So uh, that they're going to do that. And all I'm asking for them is that they kind of minimize it as much as they can um, because it can get distracting for me. And trust me, I get distracted easily. Somebody says squirrel, and I'm going over here. So um, anyway, that, that may happen today. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, we're just so glad that you're with us, and you chose us to, to worship today and, and break open God's Word. We'd love to get to know you. Um, we have a gift in the back if you want to grab one of those on your way out, um, or grab one of the pastors here and just, uh, just say hi. We're really a friendly church, so love to get to know you there. Um, we're going to today uh, continue our series in James. We're going to finish up chapter 3. Uh, Joey started chapter 3 last week and talked about controlling uh, your tongue and um, the challenges there. Uh, but then we're going to segue into chapter 4. So there's a lot of material to cover. I'm going to do the best I can to, to break it down. Um, so this can either be, I've practiced it a few times, and um, it went from 40 minutes to 22 minutes. So I'm not sure where God's going to lead this today, but he's going to, he's going to, we may be early or we may not be. So we're, we're going to see. It's a lot of scripture and we're going to try and do our best to cover it all. So let's go ahead and open with prayer and, and we'll dive right in. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we are just so grateful today to um, be able to be here together as a body of Christ and that we can look at your word and what James is trying to tell us and how living in the world, um, it can bring conflict and strife, and we know that. But uh, you seek for us a deep relationship, a relationship that um, we can rely on and, and that we can move close to you, and in that um, can push us to a humble faith. And I just pray, Lord, that I can just be an instrument uh, for you, that we can bring glory to you, because that's really what this is all about. Um, we thank you again for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross and, and paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. Um, we just thank you for him and his uh, sacrifice. We love you, God, and I just thank you for everybody here, and um, just pray we have a good message today. Amen. So I know we're a little bit more than halfway through our sermon series here in James, and what I, I really want to do, I know Joey and Jonathan have uh, broken it down um, the history there. I just want to kind of rehash that a little bit because I think it's good at this point to do that. Um, and whenever in small group, my small group will tell you whenever I was teaching, I like to always when you're reading scripture, I, this is the way I was taught that you would talk about who the author is or who's writing this book. I think that's important. Um, and who the target audience is, who they were speaking to at the time and kind of the time period. And that lets you kind of get an understanding, a better understanding of the scripture and what God was trying to, to tell us people. So James here, he is the half-brother of Jesus. I, I know we've talked about that a little bit. But one thing I, I was thinking about this week is, and I, and I started doing some research there um, on it. Could you imagine the sibling rivalry there? Not from Jesus' side, but from James' side. As a, as a young boy growing up there in the same house with God and, and what that would be like. Um, so Jesus would be that quintessential kid that would uh, literally, if, I don't know if they had sports back then, but if they did, 
Think about that. Um, you know, he goes out and he's the all-star at everything, you know. Um, or, you know, how he, uh, for going to school, um, he would be the straight-A student and not even try. Science, he's got it. He wrote the book, um, Design the Universe, right? So, and then, um, you know, Scripture, he, again, wrote the book there. So Jesus literally would be the perfect child. And growing up with that, I, I would think, you know, Jesus certainly wouldn't make James feel in an awkward way. But in, in our human sense, I think, growing up, that, that would bring... Uh, some difficulties and challenges. And, and there's other books in the Bible that talk a little bit, very briefly, uh, about that. So um, James was a pillar in the early Christian church. He was full of compassion and wisdom and, um, and a peacemaker. He, he definitely was a peacemaker. There was a lot of conflict going on during this time. And he's speaking primarily to the early Christians there in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians. And, and again, there, there is a lot of things going on in the church at the time. The book was written around AD 69, so that kind of gives us a context of the time period of, in reference to Jesus there. So, um, yeah, so AD, AD 69. <clears throat> what I want to do here is we're going to do uh, some slides. I've got four slides I want to show you, and it's a side-by-side -side comparison. So as we uh, start to get into chapter 3, James is going to talk about, in chapter 3, about wisdom here in the, in the mid parts to the end of chapter 3. And it's the same word, but he uses it two different ways um, in the way he describes wisdom. So I just want to do a couple slides here that helps us kind of get into that mindset of side-by-side -side comparisons. So I don't know if you can really tell here uh, what this is, but in, in this bucket, this, the, the heading of it was, this is, do you guys remember hard disks there in the 80s they had, or I guess 90s. Well, that's what that is. That's equivalent to one megabyte of storage there in the 1980s. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a USB drive or a flash drive, and it said that's one gigabyte of storage. So that's a huge difference there. The same word, storage, but different capacities. Um, I was literally, my kids, we were at a, a church, my, my dad's church, um, a couple years ago, and we were in the nursery, and there was a VCR tape in it in the nursery. And my kids go, Dad, what's this? And I said, there's a movie on there. And they're like, no, come on, you're kidding, right? What, where's, where's the disc? Well, even now, Netflix or, or whatever else we have. Um, and I was telling them, yeah, that's how technology has come and, and moved. And I told them the blockbuster slogan, please be kind, please rewind. Um, they thought it was ludicrous and ridiculous, but that's, that's where we're at. So that's uh, one word, storage but different capacities. So the next one is, so again, I kind of grew up in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> so the top slide is a showing of the comparison of what technology in the 80s was then and now. So you got your computer, you got a pager or a beeper. Kid, again, the kids were like, what? And you got your, uh, your cool, uh, I don't know, I forget Walkman. what they called it, Walkman. Yeah, Walkman. And your Polaroid picture and the video recorder and your phone and and whatnot, and now it literally is in the palm of your hand. Everything you got is, is right there. So um, some of those they wouldn't understand, but that's the way we grew up. Um, so side-by-side -side comparison to that. This for the consumers, um, I thought this was a really cool slide, and it's interesting. Uh, so this is your McDonald's orange juice. Orange juice, the same word. Um, it tastes the same, but the vast difference here is the price. The one on the, I guess, the right, that's a small. And the one on the left, that's a large. So order the small, right? Because your price is different. The volume of orange juice is about the same. I thought that was quite interesting there. <clears throat> and so the next one, this is my favorite one. Um, this what I describe as mom fun, and this is dad fun, right? <laughs> so um, the word fun, the same word. But two completely different meanings, certainly for the kids zooming down the, the slide there. Um, on the left, you have security and compassion, and, um, and they're, they're having fun. He's having fun there. And then on the right, the dad's, look, look, I mean, you can see his smile. Yeah, he puts them on the slide and slides them down, and chaos, death, and destruction, possibly. So um, same word, fun, but two entirely different meanings on the different sides of the spectrum. So... Here, 
Today we're going to look at what James describes as heavenly wisdom. And heavenly wisdom will move us to have a humble faith. <clears throat> the antithesis of this is an earthly wisdom. An earthly wisdom that um, will cause us to be boastful, prideful, arrogant, selfish, have selfish ambition. And uh, all of which lead to conflicts, strife, and turmoil. James challenges me here. Um, and I'm sure he's challenged all of us. This whole book is, is a challenge in the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at our faith and put it into action for God. Um, literally last week when Joey preached on controlling your tongue, it, that was a really good sermon. And this whole week, my, I, I'm telling you, my family, we have tried to do that. And it has changed the dynamic in the way we communicate. Just thinking about, you know, are we putting God's words first? Is this the way God would communicate with one another? Um, and then two weeks ago, Jonathan preached about a risky faith. Are we putting our faith out there um, for him? So this whole book is challenging, and he's going to continue to do that today and how we view the world versus what God wants for us. Um, so here, there is a lot of scripture, like I said, um, so I'm going to kind of go some. I know she read it, and it was awesome having my wife read it. She could probably have stood up here and did a better job than me, but... Um, I think it's important that we look at the scriptures as we go along so we kind of remember where we're at. So James here, 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Um, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who makes peace. So James opens with a question here. Who is wise among you. James shows that the answer to this is directly dependent on our, whether our focus is limited to this life or in the life that God wants for us, in God's ways. He starts with this provocative question to test and challenge our pride. James uses the Greek word sophos in the literal translation um, to describe wisdom. Sophos <clears throat> relates to wisdom not as intellectual, but the real-life use of moral reasoning. Um, it's translated literally as piety, and it's wisdom with humility. He asks, who is wise among you? Can we look at a person and tell they are wise merely by their appearance, whether they have gray hair or wrinkles, or my wife got me glasses here now because I need glasses. My arms aren't long enough. Um, but no, we can't look at someone and say, because of the age they have or the experiences they have, that's not the wisdom James is talking about. It can't, we can't look at someone and say they have this heavenly wisdom that he's describing. Can we say someone is wise merely by the numbers or letters they have behind their name? PhD, MBA, doctorate. It, it merely means we're educated. Now, education is good and, and it's helpful, but it doesn't meet the standard of what James is talking about, about a heavenly wisdom. Um, I know a lot of educated people that make poor decisions and poor choices, and they're boastful, prideful, and arrogant. Um, what about Christians that think biblical knowledge is true wisdom? Knowing scripture is good. However, the problem starts when it's not living out in our lives, when it's not in our hearts, and, and we're not putting our faith into action for God and his glory. Look at the Pharisees and the teachers and the scribes of Jesus' day. They knew the law. Um, they added cumbersome loads to their flock and would not lift a finger to help. They were supposed to lead people to Jesus and to God, and instead, their religion was rooted in prideful hearts. Um, they were not following what James was describing as heavenly wisdom. They knew the letter of the law, but they truly missed the intent of what God was trying to convey to them. If we look at 2 Timothy 3.15 here... And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
I think that word able there is so important. Just knowing the scripture doesn't mean you're automatically going to be this wise that God is talking about, this heavenly wisdom. It's able to do it, but you have to apply it to your lives. We have to put it into action for God. We must do this and have this heavenly wisdom. We have to move towards that. James describes the earthly wisdom as bitter jealousy and selfishness, boastful and full of selfish ambition. Sorry, got to do that. Um, Do we have jealousy in our hearts towards people in our church, in our communities, towards our neighbors, our coworkers? Jealousy will always lead to conflict when we put that first. What about selfishness? In our marriages. Um, did not think. We see it where one spouse will say, my needs are more important than theirs. We see it where they say, my spouse does not meet my expectations any longer. You see, when we put that word, the love, it's being stripped away. We need to treasure our marriages because they're truly a gift from God. What Matthew 6.21 says is, for where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. Selfishness always leads to conflict. What about selfish ambition? Again, about our coworkers. Are we upset that our colleagues got something that we think we deserved or, or we didn't get? Are we after that next big purchase? Notice I didn't say ambition, because ambition's okay. To have ambition is fine, but that selfish ambition, that's where it's all about me again. That will lead to conflict. You see, we can all identify with these at some point in our lives. At some point, we have all fallen to these traps. All of these are about bringing glory to ourselves and not to God. I certainly have fallen into these traps. I've put myself before God and others. This happens when arrogance creeps in. And we're going to talk about arrogance and pride here when we get to chapter 4. How pride leads to a faith in ourselves, and it's a dead faith. It's a dead end. James warns about these attributes time and again of earthly earthly wisdom, that they're unspiritual and they're demonic. He literally says that in, in this verse. Jonathan spoke about demons a few weeks ago and how very real they are and how they have knowledge, and how they want to seek and destroy and move us away from that relationship that God is seeking for us, that he wants to be close to us. Um, they, they have this knowledge that they want to push us away from God. The earthly wisdom doesn't push us to have a faith that God can use for his glory. This would be godly wisdom. Obviously, this is the type of wisdom that we want to identify with. James says, wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. If we look at these attributes, look at each one of them, and break them down, you see Jesus in every single one of them. Christ is right there in all of these attributes that James is describing as heavenly wisdom. He's first pure. Christ was without sin. He was the perfect sacrifice, the only one that could go to the cross and do what he did for you and for me. He had the weight of every curse poured out on him, and he paid that price for me, and he was still pure. Christ was pure, peaceable. He's certainly peaceable. Look at what this verse says in John 16, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Christ is certainly peaceable. In the world, he says there, we are going to have tribulation. But he's overcome the world. He has won that victory in that battle for us. Christ is peaceable. He's full of mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 say, but God rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He's rich in mercy. He showers us with grace and mercy, and we certainly don't deserve this. 
He's full of good fruits. He's impartial. Thank goodness he's impartial. There's that mercy and grace again coming in. <clears throat> and he's certainly sincere. Christ did everything he said he was going to do. Every prophecy was fulfilled by him. He's sincere. All of these, every one of these attributes, if you break them down one by one, you can see Jesus in. This is wisdom that we need to identify with. This leads to a wisdom from above that can help us to have a faith that God can use for him and his glory. None of these attributes, not one of these that we just talked about, are about ourselves, but they're about loving others and putting others before ourselves. These can help us form that humble faith, a faith that is led by humility and peace. In fact, James calls us in verse 18 there, he calls us peacemakers. This is interesting as we look, and we're going to segue into chapter 4, because in the beginning here of chapter 4, <coughs> again, there's turmoil and there's problems. And James is trying to um, handle these and, and talk about them. So if we look at James 4, 1 through 10. At the beginning of this chapter, oh, I'm sorry. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It is not this, that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit, that he is made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. James again opens with a question here. <clears throat> James is trying to show us how seeking after the things of this world leads to conflict and strife and turmoil. Let me ask you a question. Whenever you have conflicts and problems in your house, fights with your spouse, your kids, teenagers, that seems the teenagers. I've got two in my house. Um, what is this truly about? Uh, is it because they're not willing to receive the wonderful gifts you're, you have in store for them or about to bestow upon them? Probably not. If we dig in and we're truthful, it's really about our feelings. Our selfish desires are not being met. Look back at what James says here in 4, 1 through 3. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, to spend it on your passions. <clears throat> you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, but could you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions? Did I read that wrong? I did, didn't I? That's okay. Um, our passions are at war within us. Our desires are not met. These selfish desires or passions, as James calls them, leads to a conflict within ourselves, an internal strife, and move us away from God. Look at what James does in verse 4, how serious this is. He likens this to adulterers. They were so wrapped up in their own individual passions and desires, they were seeking after the world, and James calls them out. He's called me out. Look at how he says friendship with the world is enmity with God. The word enmity means actively opposing God. We are actively opposing God if we're in the world. I, I have to let that sink in. I'm actively opposing God if I'm in the world, if I'm seeking after the things of this world. I read that, and if I'm in the world, I feel so far away from God. I feel so sad because my sinful condition is to identify with the world. 
to lean toward the earthly wisdom that James was warning and describing about earlier. To not have the relationship that God desires for me. James also says God opposes the proud. Being proud and arrogant is earthly wisdom that's all about ourselves and not about bringing glory to God. So the beginning here of chapter 4, it's difficult to read in here because I identify with a lot of this. James, again, is pointing to that human condition of making things about ourselves. But luckily, he starts to show near the end of these verses the cure for this condition, and it's Jesus. You see, James tells us that God wants to have that deep relationship with each one of us. He talks about faith and humility and how that will begin to unlock this intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. Imagine that type of relationship that God wants. He asks us about submission. And I know that word there is tough to hear. I'm a type A personality guy, and I don't want to submit to anything. But what am I submitting to? I'm submitting to a God that controls everything, that literally controls the next breath that I take. He, he is in control. So that should be so freeing to us that we're submitting to something that has total control. He wants us to draw near to him, and this is the relationship that he wants, a close relationship. He asks us to humble ourselves And he ends with the fact that he will exalt us. God will exalt us. That that blows me away. We're supposed to submit and exalt him. But if we draw near to him and have that relationship with him and follow his ways and put our faith into action, he will exalt us. I read this and thought, wow, God really wants to have that deep relationship with me, even if I don't deserve it. This is because God doesn't think in the same terms that we do. He looks at me and says, I love you, even despite my shortcomings. Try to imagine if you could literally walk side by side with God. That's what happened in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. Adam got that opportunity to walk side by side with God. How awesome that would be. And that's the way it was until that earthly wisdom crept in. That sin broke that relationship where pride and arrogance and selfish ambition. Adam was told that he would be like God. So that sin and selfishness broke that. Um, we are so distracted at times, and we don't seem to have time for God. Imagine God saying, hey, Adam, I'd like to get close and to hang out. And Adam's saying, well, God, I really don't have time. I've got this perfect garden you've given me, but I've got to tend to it. I've got to mow it. I've got to edge it i got to make sure everything is perfect, even though it's already perfect. I don't really have time. Or here's one that we can identify with. God saying, Adam, let's get close. And Adam's saying, well, God, I'm so far behind on my social media. My Facebook, my Instagram, my Twitter, I just don't have time. I have this one follower now, and this sweet thing, Eve, that you gave me, I have to catch up with her. So I don't really have time. You see, all these things distract us from this personal relationship that God wants for each one of us. Um, we, we need to have this deep relationship. God wants and covets that for us. He knows if we can remove ourselves from the world and the distractions, he, that relationship will begin to be unlocked. And he will then push our faith, a faith that he can use for him, that will begin to unlock. He desperately wants this for you and me. We need to look at this heavenly wisdom to have a humble faith. And I know that he loves us and he longs for that for each one of us. To have his ways alive in our hearts and not our own. Let's pray.